Welcome to Combo Ricos. Smith & Wesson Bodyguard <laughs> 380 review. Apparently there are um, there's another bodyguard out there. It's not a 380, so I, I must include that 380 in the title. So for the down and dirty review for the people just want my opinion about this gun, real quick, not you know, keep you here too long. I have uh, two guns in the 380 caliber, this one and also car. Um, and so I've handled the Ruger LCP and the Taurus Spectrum. Um, if I had to rank the guns, uh, I would rank the car as number one. Um, uh, well, it's actually really hard to do because it depends on what you want. If you want as far as like, if uh, let's just say all the guns were equally reliable, well, the car, you know, so the reliable is, let's just say they're all like Glocks, right? They all work. So I would say, well, the car would be the best, it's the most comfortable, best trigger, and uh, and um, yeah. Um, I usually don't go by looks, by the way, but this would probably be the best look. And mainly it's fit and finish. But um, So if they all work the same, they're all reliable, I would say car number one, bodyguard, would be tied with uh, the Taurus Spectrum. Um, the reason they would be tied is because their sights are um, the same quality. Um, the car does have a better sight. Um, I guess I'll show you that real quick. Okay, there's a quick shot of that for you real, uh, I guess we only do one at a time. Um, that white dot helps, trust me. Um, you can see the car on the left has a lower um, rear sight, so that actually doesn't help it. Um, what would help it is that white paint. Um, here you have it, you know, a nice taller. But um, my opinion, the car has better sights. And like I said, the Taurus Spectrum has just as good of sights. Uh, the Ruger LCP didn't have very good sights as well. It was very easy to get lost. They're both black. There is no paint on those either. Okay, so that would be the down and dirty. Um, also, the quality on this gun is, is, is very good. Uh, it actually has uh, steel rails as opposed to the car, which is, you know, just regular polymer or plastic. Okay, um, the car is on the left again. And the... Uh, Bodyguard 380, the Smith & Wesson's on the right. So what I'm going to show you here, we're talking about the rails. Um, so you have nice, I need a pointer. Um, don't judge me by this knife, by the way. Um, nice steel uh, rails. I actually don't own a pistol with steel rails. Um, this is actually kind of important because if you really notice, this is the car here, of course. Um, this plastic is getting eaten away, these plastic rails. So I don't know how long this gun is going to last without um well it already has problems maybe that's probably not the reason why but so that's a really nice touch um you can also tell um from here well maybe you can't i don't know but i can tell that the car actually just looks a, a wee bit smaller i did said wee it's not very southern of me uh, i don't think yeah um Okay, so it does have the, what I would say, the best fit and finish. You could easily, I could easily tell that um, between the Ruger LCP and the Taurus Spectrum just by handling it. As far as triggers are concerned, I was not, I did not have access to the trigger. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, so I can't talk about the triggers of the Ruger's LCP or the Taurus's Spectrum. Um, however, with this gun, I did notice um, it was not well lubricated when I purchased it as far as a visual inspection. And not just visual inspection, but also um, working the trigger after I'd bought it, after I bought it. Uh, there was, after, after you know, several repetitions of dry firing, uh, maybe like a week of dry firing, um, I noticed, started noticing a squeaking. So that's when I took um, action. Um, also, this gun was, was seemed a little dirtier than any other purchase I've had. Um, I could notice it, it's actually stained. Um, right here in this, you can actually see this, this disc was cleaned. Well, actually, this was cleaned. Um, this was all dark, and I, I understand that they have to do testing um, for these guns at the factory, but that's just something to take a note of, as it did seem to be a little bit more um, 
dirty than any gun I've received before. Um, so I shot about 150 rounds for this gun. I did have about four or five light primer strikes. Okay, um, the cases on the top, the primers on the top, I believe were done from the um, car. I, I, in all honesty, I was not keeping track of what was shooting what. But um, for this video, I decided it'd be neat to go and see if I could actually get some. So just a thing of note is this one on the far um, bottom right, that seems to be the lightest. And also there's a really, uh, you can see a distinct trailing of the hammer there. Um, but that's just a visual. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's coming very clearly um, in the camera. But it seems that there's two distinct primers, uh, strikes. There's these deeper ones and more uh, round. And they do have um, some of that marking as well. Um, and then you have these, which just seem a little bit lighter. And of course on the camera, that's not as easy to tell. So the good news, and um, it's, it's actually well known that this gun produces light primer strikes and there is a fix for it. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that installation will uh, void your warranty, and I understand it's a lifetime warranty with Smith & Wesson, which is, is ridiculous. They shouldn't, uh, they themselves should fix it, which they may do, but I, the fact that they sell kits kind of tells me they don't. Um, and so the good news is there is a fix. Bad news it voids your warranty, and even more bad news is that fix will add a pound to your trigger pull, and the trigger is quite heavy. Uh, this is my first hammer, um, hammer pistol. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I did have a quality col uh, quality control issue also with this gun, and uh, I'm not sure how much it actually um, is an issue or not. I'll show you real quick. Okay, if you just notice right there in the middle, uh, top middle of the screen, there's a little roller. I'm going to roll it now. So you can see there clearly the facing of that roller. This is the trigger, um, uh, right, this is the trigger actuating course. So you can see that there's clearly some kind of um, uh, facing issue that's been, uh, there's, there's a, uh, um, a galling of it, a removal of a layer, it's a, a divot type thing. Um, I don't know how much that goes into play, but that is a quality control issue, that's the way I bought it. Also a side note, this is probably not a quality control issue, but this gun shares the same mystery as the Glock. Which is, sometimes, not every time, I don't even know, probably 25% of the time, when the slide is locked back and you're loading a magazine, sometimes you load the magazine and the slide will drop and it will chamber around into the gun. This gun does it as well. Okay, um, so moving on. Um, this, the slide, uh, the spring for this slide is superior to the car. And I'm not sure, I don't have a tripod, I'm not sure how well I can demonstrate this. But I'll, well, I'm going to try to show you with the car, but I won't show you with this just because I, I won't be able to. Basically, the slide, let's say it's all the way back. When you're sliding it forward, it gets to a point where it just wants to shut. So there is a really nice shutting action where it's in its shut position now for this gun. Now with this car, it, it, this car has a stronger spring than the Smith & Wesson. However, it doesn't translate the same. The strength is when it's all the way back. When it's almost closed, it doesn't have the same strength. And um, like I said, one hand here. Come on, baby. So here it's just, yes, it's shutting. And it's probably because I just cleaned it, but it, this gun has a tendency not to want to shut. And when it's not all the way shut, it will not fire the trigger, it will not actuate. Um, and so whatever they did on this trigger for this Smith & Wesson is just a much better job. Um, this gun just wants to shut. Um, so that's good. Also what's cool is Smith & Wesson, they give you two magazines. 
um, which is really nice. The extra magazine for this gun costs $50, I believe, which is, you know, maybe uh, this gun, I, I got it uh, $220 around, around there. So that's, you know, almost a quarter of the price of the gun. Um, one thing I don't like, but which is really common, the magazines are not the same. Um, you can see that, which is a training issue, but hey, you know, it's this is $50 and um, they gave it to us, so that's really good. Um, trying to make this too long here, but we got some content. Um, the safety for this gun is the best safety I've ever seen for a pistol, or really for any gun. Um, should I let this bother me? I don't know. Okay. This thing is, is just, right now it's in the off position. I don't believe in safeties, but... Um, Okay, it's super hard. I couldn't even. It's it's just really difficult to get this. Um, get this. I could right here. I actually have this super. It's not really a superstition, but I don't want to actuate this too much. I just don't want to wear it, and I know it's not going to do it. But I just have a personal thing there. It's the best safety. Um, that all drives into another point at the very end of the video. I actually was not wanting not wanting to get a safety version, but I was forced to in the end. So we'll talk about that later. So that's a really good job on safety. All safety should be like this. This safety is not a problem for me. Uh, it's it's a really great safety. Um, the skirted hammer. Um, I think this gun is clear. That's something we shouldn't be saying, right? Um, a skirted hammer, you can't pull it back. Um, actually, I prefer you could pull it back. I don't think if it was exposed, it would really cause much of a problem. But I understand the market and why they did it. But that's... To me, you're paying for. Um, if you're getting a hammer, you're paying. You're t you're taking a penalty. I'm not, and the only benefit I can think of, I currently am aware of, is you have that ability to go into that a single action mode. Hopefully, um, if the gun's you know set up in that way. Um, and that's gone from this, so it's uh, negative. Okay, as far as taking this gun down, um, the pin removal here. It is very, it's rough at first. I've never, I, I don't, I've never had this action of uh, takedown before. It does seem to wear easier after several operations, so it is getting easier. However, so the pin extraction is, is getting to the point where it's, you know, it's fine. Um, now the pin insertion, when you're putting the gun back together, that always seems to be multiple attempt thing. You have to have this, the, the barrel all the way back. But even then, it's it's really, I don't know, it's not smooth. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk about, um, well, the 380 in general. I guess is, that was supposed to be the short part of the review, but that's it's not going to be a long video. I just didn't tell them when to stop. Anyways, watching them as in the people didn't want to watch the whole video. So 380s in general are very, are notoriously unreliable. The reason why is because there's not very much mass in these slides. And so there's not much mass, you have to have a very strong spring to push something light. Whereas if you have a heavy object, it, the, the inertia will help everything. But with this light thing, it really, it needs something to push it around. It doesn't have the, the inertia of a heavier slide. Um, and if this thing, well, okay. So I'm not sure why I just said that. That's just one point I have in here. Um, but let's talk about the fallacy of the sights for these guns. So it is really common, um, and in fact, the earliest 380 I know of, I know that there was the Behringer, you know, in the 1930s or whatever. Um, there's always been small guns, or not always, but there's been small guns in the past, not these aren't the first. But modern, recent modern times, as in like maybe 2005 or early 2000 or something, kel was the first one I'm aware of that introduced uh, the 380 pistol successfully again. And it was called like the AT4, or that's a, that's a bomb, AT, <laughs> um, I don't know what it's called, it's a kel 380. It did not come with sights, okay? Um, on the foothills, on the skirts, riding the skirts of kel which is a really common trend. I'm, I'm a kel fan. I don't actually own a kel but I can appreciate a company who has the courage and just the passion to create something new. They, they, what usually happens with kel is they... They introduced a new gun. Um, this 380 uh, pistol would be an example. The shotgun bullpup would be an example. 
Um, also the um, um, the 308 bull pups. They're one of the earliest ones to release it. And then basically people take that design and they, they make it better or they take the idea and make it better. So on the on the on the coattails on the skirts, I guess it's the coattails. Right in the coattails of Keltec, Ruger introduces their LCP, which is probably the most popular or most sold. Uh, 380, I, pocket pistols, what I call these. Um, uh, let's see here. So, where are we in the story? I'm lost. I don't know where I am. Help me. I'm what I'm trying to. I'm trying to quote a line from uh, Waterboy there, the coach. Um, but no, seriously, I'm lost here. Um, so Kelta or so Ruger made uh, their their LCP, which is very well sold. They kept the idea of Keltec not to put sights on here. Again, the, what we're talking about, how the fallacy of you don't need sights for these guns. And I'm telling you that you should, in my experience, I would be really sad if I didn't have any sights in these guns, and I'll tell you why, but let me tell you the history, and let me just keep rambling on here. So, um, um, so, Ruger has their LCP, and then Smith & Wesson sees how well they're doing, and so they make this thing um, with sights, which is good. Car, this gun was actually, I, would, if I, had, I don't really know the timeline. I should have probably done that for the video. Maybe I could do it now. Maybe I don't want to. Or maybe I'm thinking about it. Uh, okay, so I just sort of did try to look it up. Um, I'm right in the middle of it right now, so... Um, the Caltech came out in 2004, the LCP came out in 2008 at SHOT Show. The car, I can't seem to find a date for it, it's not as well um, known of a pistol, and I just don't want to spend all this time. It's actually, yeah, y'all don't need to know that. Um, so, I don't know, but according to my understanding, because I was alive during this time, and I was looking at guns, and, but I'm not, anyways, my bet would be, um, the Keltec came out first, and then this gun, and then the LCP, or it might have been LCP and this gun, and then this gun, but I do believe this gun came for this one. Um, and then there's others. There's, there's others. So, i am lost my place again. Um, so, we're talking about sights. Um, that's what this, all this is about. So, they eventually started getting sights on them. I believe this was the first 380 that actually had sights on it, and they still had the best sights. Um... You want to have sights on these guns, okay? So the fallacy is, oh, this is a caliber. This this is a, such a small pistol that you're not actually in real life. You're not actually going to use the sights. This is a gun that you use when someone's basically on you. If it's even more than like five yards away, you don't use this gun. That's all. That's that's a bunch of um, um, garbage there. This gun, I, I practice. Well, the first the first thing, the most important thing, when you go shooting, you want to you want to like, aim at stuff. You don't want to just pull the trigger and shoot you know so having fun at the range requires sights and that's what most of the time we're doing with these guns so that's a really good reason to have sights on the guns and, and this whole fallacy of these sights you can see that's probably why they made these so low is oh this is going to get caught on your pocket and you're not going to it's ridiculous it's just not true um well, it's not ri <laughs> I, <laughs> that sound you just heard was a, i guess a dry mouth let me take another drink of water <sighs> Alcohol is bad for you. So you want to have sights. That's how you have fun at the range. You're going to really miss it if you don't have sights. And I shoot this gun 20 yards easily, consistently at um, a 10 inch, an 8 inch point, really. It's not even a 10 inch plate. And um, they're fun, usable. Um, I think I've shot at 100 yards with this thing. I know I've shot in 50. It's not, it's so usable. Um, as far as the sights, I think, yeah, I've already covered that in the beginning of the video. Um, I want to talk about the size of these guns. Glock would have been my first choice. They made it too big. There's, you do not, you want the guns in around this size. You don't want them any bigger. And Glock went a size bigger and it, and that's, I would have gone to them first. Um, I, so, but they just made a mistake there. Um, so why is this gun better than this gun? I said earlier, the more details, the grip is better. I noticed more, I think it's this protrusion right here. If you can, 
um, this slight protrusion caused, you know, I can almost still see it. It's right there. It's been like a week or two since I shot. Um, this is just more comfortable. This is also wider. Um, this is not so wide. I don't have, I have small hands. Also the trigger um, is too thin on this gun. And what it does is it causes, um, it causes you when you're aiming to jerk up and to the right. So it's because, because it's so thin, um, you can't get a good straight line pull on it. Your finger naturally kind of wants to come to one direction. Um, your finger also wants to slip off of it, it if you're sweaty. Um, and again, we said it was squeaky. I put some oil on that. And actually took a, a much oil. I I uh, I do subscribe to the idea that you don't want much oil. I know we saw much. We saw oil in the gun. Anyways, um, I do subscribe to the idea that you don't want to put too much oil um, at all. But this took uh, two different occasions of putting oil to get rid of this squeak, and it was kind of painful putting that second layer. But I really wanted to get that. That's uh, that squeak didn't sound right, and I, it isn't white right because it's gone now. So. Um, also, we can talk real quick about the crispness of a trigger. Uh, this is my first hammer trigger, so I am learning some stuff. And I think there's, let me just read what I have here. Um, one concept of the crisp, a crisp trigger is when you reach that point of no more movement in the trigger, that's a crisp trigger, and then it releases. As opposed to this idea that the release is a surprise release. Um, they are two different things. This gun here, the trigger, let me, this, let me do it as the way I introduced it. This is a trigger where you do reach that point of no more return, but it seems like you get hung on it. And it seems it's, you, they have this phrase, it's a clean break. This does have a clean break as far as I understand that term. However, I find myself getting on to that break and not able to, to break through it. It does, there's no, it, it is a surprise. There isn't any more like sloppiness in the trigger, but I find myself getting hung up on that, that, um, that break point. Whereas on this one, um, there's a lot of movement and there really isn't a, I think I'm just now realizing, I would say this has probably a crisp, a clean break, and this one doesn't. Um, there's more movement in here. There isn't a point of no return. It just surprises you. Um, and it is a lighter deal. Also, what's very, very important about the hammer, reason probably why I will never get a hammer again, is you want to ride the trigger, which they call staging, I guess. Anyway, this manual for this book calls it staging. Which means you pull the trigger back, the gun goes bang, and then you slowly release your trigger, your finger back until you hear it pop, and then you shoot again. Not possible with the hammer trigger, as far as I understand, is only possible with striker. That's really important because um, all this movement of going forward and backward, it really moves the gun, and I personally don't like it. I consider riding the trigger to be a true self-defense technique, um, and I do find this to be. Um, inferior technology, ancient, or not ancient, but um, just inferior. It's, it's been surpassed now, the hammer, as far as I understand. Uh, maybe there's some other benefit that I don't know about. You know, we did talk about the um, the single action, double action guns. Um, that's nice, but I think I would always want to do this with Stryker. Um, so, the last thing, um, a little treat for y'all to sticking around this long. Um, let's talk about why I'll never buy a gun at Cabela's again, okay? Um, the reason why is all their guns now have a locking mechanism. They have a case, a lock over the trigger. And the reason for that um, is because in Kansas City, this is what the clerk told me there, Cabela's, and I went and looked it up myself and it appears to be true. Um, I saw it on a news story. Someone went into Cabela's and wanted to see a gun, clerk hands him the gun, and um, and so the guy looks at the gun, well, he gets a bullet, puts a bullet in the magazine, and then shoots himself in the head right there, you know, in front of everybody. And because of that, um, 
this selfish person, and he is selfish because I mean, he could have went done what he basically did his last act. Um, you know, I'm trying not to dis, dis, uh, de denigrate his life or whatever, or it's probably him, um, their life. But the last act that they did is they, this gun company throughout all of America, now they basically, he ruined all the gun owners' experience, or, you know, our purchasing experience by this act. Um, so, yeah, so there's really point, it's pointless buying a gun if you don't really know the trigger um, as far as if you're trying to make decisions between different models. Um, also, one thing on Cabela's as well, their advertisement, this gun was on sale, their advertisement failed to inform that you had to buy a specific model. And then when I got there and very end of the purchase, you know, the point of, you know, giving my social security number and all this other um, illegal information, it's illegal because I believe the Privacy Act of 1978 or something. What it, it it says that the Social Security number can only be asked for in respect of Social Security matters. Um, this has to do with the to to pass the Social Security law back in the day. They had to lie to the American people and say, "Oh, we're only doing this number. We're only giving this number to every citizen in the land," because. Um, for Social Security, we promise we won't ever use this number for anything else. And so they pass that privacy law or whatever. And of course, nowadays, you have to give that number to everybody because it was it was a farce that they sold us at in the beginning. Man, this is a long video. Um, so, um, yeah, they didn't tell me about that, but I thank God that this uh, safety wasn't a big issue. And so I just went ahead and got it anyways. Um, and just the last thing for y'all for sticking around, um, just want to give you kind of a news update as far as the times we're living in. Um, I live in Texas, in Texas, in San Antonio, outside of San Antonio, there was a man with an AR-15 went into a church and shot up a bunch of people. He bought that, uh, AR-15 from a sport. This is a store in Texas known as Academy Sports and Outdoors. It used to be family owned. It was recently sold to a bunch of lawyers or something, um, in New York probably three years ago or so. Um, he, the shooter, went to Sport Academy Sports and Outdoors and bought the AR-15. The person who bought sold him the gun failed to um, get all the proper identification or whatever, supposedly. And so the families of these people are trying to sue this um, firearm. It's, it's sports, you know, sport, you know, we all know what sports are, um, soccer, football, whatever. Rugby, tennis. They're trying to sue these this store for selling them the gun illegally, um, and so, um, so that's bad. And so, with the Cabela's, also with this story, this guy shooting himself. <laughs> um, you can just see that these stores, they're there's just these gun stores are so ready. We're the main ones are so ready to to uh, shut the door on selling these guns. Dicks, which is a piece of crap. I know they. I stopped supporting. I never really went to Dicks anyways because they didn't have much of a selection. But um, back in the Sandy Hook false shooting thing, I say false shooting because um, the guy there was a guy that uh, wanted to investigate it. His name is Wolfgang Halbig. Um, he investigated it, and. I don't know, the FBI or somebody started calling them. And we all know it deep in our hearts. If we try to investigate anything that happens in America, if you start making phone calls, well, they're going to start, they're going to call you back and say, why are you asking these? We all know deep in our hearts that it's illegal to ask questions. So I don't really need to explain to you what happened at Sandy Hook. But um, Dix, it's boy, uh, after Sandy Hook, they wanted to, they put their guns up and now they're getting rid of the guns and supposedly breaking them and stuff. Or destroying the guns, um, which I highly doubt. I'm sure they did destroyed a few of them, but um, so the time is getting near where these things are going to be hard to buy. Um, local gun um, stores, we still have those, you know, in the South, but most people um, elsewhere in America don't have access to those. So it's just getting really hard. And as far as buying a gun, anyway. So I just wanted to tell you about the story of Cabela's and the story of Academy and the. Um, treacherous dicks <clears throat> sporting goods don't buy stuff from them 
uh, if you can, um, at least try to make the effort. Um, just to keep you all aware, thank you for watching the video, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed.